All right, thanks again to everyone who has joined so far. It looks like people are still logging in and getting registered, but we're gonna get started um, in just a moment. Um, my name is Catlin and I run the marketing for Universe of Americas, and I'm here with Carly Creighton, our head of Latin America, um, for our webinar on the emerging markets. Um, and this is a special focus on LATAM, but it's part of a larger series. Um, just want to, before we get started, apologize in advance for some of the noise. It seems like it's an especially uh, noisy day in New York today, and so there might be some traffic sounds throughout. We'll try and um, try and prevent that, but not much we can do. Um, so just wanted to give everyone a warning there. Um, all right, and we will get started. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Carly Creighton, and I head up the Latin America division for Universum Global. We're so excited to have you join us today. I'm really looking forward to sharing with you some key insights we've been learning from emerging markets. Today kicks off the first of a series of emerging market um, trends throughout the globe, focusing first on Latin America. We have expanded our business significantly over the past several years, and as a result, gained a ton of really rich insight from, from these markets and the talent trends happening in these very lucrative markets for businesses. So um, today we're going to go through some of the things that I've been noting and observing for Latin America that will hopefully be um, themes and insights you can take back to your businesses as you think about recruiting in these markets and operating in these markets um, in order to build your employer brand. It is widely believed uh, that emerging markets matter. Um, these economies are expected to really drive global growth. Uh, additionally, we expect that talent's really going to be coming out of these markets. So the war on talent, as it's often referred to, is a, is a very real thing. And the scarcity of talent is certainly a challenge that many of us are dealing with, whether we're a big organization, a small organization, whether we're global or local. Uh, talent is scarce, and that's a very true reality for all of us. Um, emerging markets, therefore, are becoming a focal point for organizations to look when it comes to recruiting the top talent. Um, economy is looking to expect for, uh, excuse me, economy is looking to increase 4.7% um, in these developing countries. Um, you know, the, the market's really taking a bigger portion and a bigger load of our global economic growth and really seeing also on top of this trend and the growth happening here, a much younger and much younger group of talent. So prime for the future of what our business needs are within our organization. Um, and that's why we've taken some time today and we're, we're really focused on sharing insights with you around these emerging markets. As I mentioned, the first part of the series really focused on Latin America. Um, this past year in 2015, Universum has expanded its operations into six new markets in the Latin American region. So we have Brazil and Mexico as the two biggest economies, um, but additionally, we have expanded our research to cover Chile, Colombia, Argentina, Peru, Panama, and Costa Rica. So a lot of what you see today and a lot of the insights we share are based on um, knowledge that we have from working across those markets, over hundreds of thousands of um, young talent giving us their feedback on the market and their, their expectations and their trends. Um, across these eight countries. It's a really robust data set um, that we're looking at today. So we're going to cover, um, as I look at the trends and what's happening, you know, seven key themes uh, bubbled up for me that I think you should know about today. And so we're going to cover each one of these, um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what they mean and, and what data there is to support them. And at the end, sort of sum up how you can think about leveraging this information to manage your businesses and run your businesses more effectively as you think about recruiting talent in these markets. So we'll start with the first one, which is that our future talent pipeline is vast with limits. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean that, as we've discussed, emerging markets are a huge source of talent, um, but there are limitations to that talent. Um, Latin America is a high-focus region for foreign corporations, so here we're looking at um, a chart up until 2013 of foreign direct investment um, in billions of dollars. And you can see Brazil's that top line in, in red, um, and Mexico's just behind it. But you see a general trend up and to the right of foreign direct investment in these markets over time. Um, and we expect those trends only, only to continue. 
noted earlier, the population is much younger than Europe's population and North America's population. So you can see here South America being the third line down. 26% um, is age 0 to 14, and 47% is age 15 to 44. Um, so a large majority of the population is very young and therefore making it really prime talent. Um, if you look down to the second to last row as well, you see Central America, which has some of the youngest talent um, available. But I think that's part of the reason why these countries export talent. So while they have really young, really able and capable talent, um, they are tending to export that talent outside of their home country. So what you see in this graph is the median line um, where, the, where the years are located is sort of flat. Um, anything that falls above that line means that they are net importers of talent, meaning they're attracting more talent into their country than is leaving. Um, and everything below the line is net exporters of talent. So the color coding is a bit hard to tell here, but you can see at the bottom, Peru and Brazil are huge net exporters of talent um, outside um, outside their, their local markets. Um, and the, the implications of this, right, is that it shrinks the size of the talent pool significantly as you lose talent in your home country to markets abroad. That said, edu educational attainment does continue to be low, um, and that will be another variable that will shrink the talent pool. So if we use um, Colombia as an example, you can see it there in white in the middle of the graph. 20% of the talent in Colombia of population age 25 and older have a college or university degree. So only a fifth of the population is receiving that university level education, which is um, putting, putting them into that category of skilled labor for the workforce. Um, and as a result, you take the, the already small population of Colombia and you take only 20% of that in your talent pool. You can see how your talent pool shrinks tremendously as a result of educational attainment. So for all of these reasons, right, it is, a, it is a very exciting place to be. It is a huge place of investment and focus. However, we need to be aware of some of the limitations that exist due to the emerging nature of these markets. The second key theme um, is that Latin America is not homogenous. You know, and I came into this industry um, and into this role, one of the big focal points of mine was to say, how do we talk about Latin America in a way that's consistent and scalable for our business, but not bucket and categorize Brazil the same as Mexico? In fact, Brazil and Mexico are very different, and our data shows that Brazilian talent has more similarities to U.S. talent than it does to Mexican talent. Um, so it's a very common challenge for organizations to expand into these regions, especially if they're global in nature, um, and not sort of put a one-size-fits-all on Latin America. But it is not homogenous. And, and let me give you some data points as to why, why that's the case. First of all, these markets vary um, in size and GDP. So just to give you an idea, um, Brazil and Mexico are the clear front runners in terms of size and economy, um, with Argentina and Colombia just behind them. You can see Panama and Costa Rica are very small. So you know the, the point here right, is that while they are all um, in the same region and almost all of them share the same language, um, of Spanish, with the exception of Brazil, they're not all the same in terms of investment opportunities, talent opportunities, etc. Even within individual countries, though, the quality of the talent heavily depends on factors like location and education. So within Universum's um, survey, we're able to see, we survey students from all parts of the country um, and with various, um, various degrees of education from top elite universities to some of the bigger statewide universities. And we do see trends happening um, in these various segments. So for example, in Mexico, the talent market is not evenly spread across the country. Mexican students are not really interested in internal relocation in Mexico. Um, and you see a very different profile of talent inside Mexico City than you do in some of the outskirts. Um, which seems like a very obvious statement, but understanding what those differences are can have a serious implication to how you approach that talent and how you go about recruiting them. So if you're, for example, a big automobile, industry, um, a big automobile comp company and you have a bunch of factories, 
a ton of factory work for the automobile industry um, is done in Mexico, you need to recruit talent to where your factories are located and getting um, some of the top talent from the top schools in Mexico City out to the outskirts uh, of town can be really challenging. So this is certainly something to, to keep in mind as you plan your recruitment strategies. Um, as a result, students in DFA and in Mexico City and Monterey have different expectations, as I was saying. So um, you can see on the far of the bar graph, on the left bar is students from Mexico City, the middle is students from Monterey, and then the purple is students from the rest of the country. And you can see, for example, work-life balance is much more important to students in Monterey as is being dedicated to a cause um, that they feel like they're a part of and that they can have an impact. So very interesting trends on what's important versus what's not um, and, and something really critical to look at. You can see as well, to be secure and stable in my job is much more important outside these two major cities, um, the purple line being the highest in that chart. So really key to understand the unique differences, not just country by country, but even within a single country. The third key um, theme that I want to touch on is work-life balance. You know, I think we talk a lot about work-life balance at Universum. Globally, it's a trend people have been talking about for years. Google has really reinvented the way we think about work-life balance. Um, but the definition of work-life balance can really get lost in translation. And what do I mean by that? When we look at emerging markets um, and if we look at their career goals, we definitely see they're focused on work-life balance. In fact, um, it's, inc it's incredibly important and even more so in these emerging markets. Um, it's also really important in all emerging markets globally for talent to be entre entrepreneurial or creative and innovative in their work and also to be secure and stable in their job. But 47% want to have work-life balance. Um, and in Latin America, if we zoom in from all emerging markets and focus just on Latin America, we see three of the top four um, strongest or four excuse me four of the top five strongest preferences for work-life balance exist in Latin America so Costa Rica Chile Brazil and Argentina this is incredibly important and the most important attribute for um, students and talent in these countries so a really strong emphasis in Latin America on this attribute well that's great a career goal is to have work-life balance but what does that mean exactly and when we asked millennials in Latin America what work-life balance means to them, it was actually a very surprising finding. Um, many of you may have programs, for example, where you offer a home office or um, you offer really good child care for moms so that they stay engaged. Um, those things are not ranking at the top of the list. The first and most important um, piece of work-life balance and what it means to them is enough leisure time for private life. Um, so it's not necessarily when they have private life and when they have time to themselves, but they just want to make sure they have enough time to take care of them in their world that lives outside of their day-to-day -day job. Um, so I think it's really key to know this and to understand this, and I talk to a lot of organizations about, you know, what does work-life balance mean for them, and, and oftentimes we make assumptions on what that means or what it should mean, when in fact um, we aren't asking the talent directly what it means for them. So really key insight here um, about the Latin American talent and what it means for them. But when we zoom even closer into Brazil, we can see it means things completely different. So the four lines that are still in green are the same rank and order in terms of priority um, and what it means to have work-life balance. But everything that's in white is different. So the second most um, commonly associated idea of work-life balance in Brazil is recognition and respect for the employees. So to have work-life balance means recognition and respect. Some of you may be thinking, I don't understand the connection there. Um, and that's why having this level of insight is super important because then as you talk about your perks and your benefits and what you offer as an organization, you can position it in a context of what's really, really important um, to the talent and to your future employees. Next um, key theme is that optimism isn't synonymous with relaxed. So optimism and relaxed um, do not mean the same thing. And what do I mean by that? Well, when we ask talent, um, you know, are you optimistic about your future? Many um, 
it's, it's overwhelming that Latinos in of the millennial generation are generally optimistic about their future. So you can see here a line graph, or a, a, I'm sorry, a bar chart comparing Latin America to the rest of the world, and 47% said they strongly agreed that over their lifetime they'll enjoy a higher standard of living than their parents. So they're thinking about their future, they're hopeful about their future, which presents a really unique opportunity for us as employers to take advantage of that positive energy and that really positive mindset. But they don't just they aren't just optimistic and willing to sort of take on any risk. They still want to set themselves up for future success. So when we complete our survey, we ask um, we ask young talent um, many questions about their career goals and their career preferences, and we divide that information among business students, engineering students, health science students, etc. Um, and here we have for you the top five. Um, attributes are the top five values that young talent finds most important among business students in Latin America. So on the left you see professional training and development is the number one most important across the region. Um, second is a good reference for their future career and third is leadership opportunities. When we look at engineering we see similar trends so professional training and development good reference for the future career um, but we also see that they want a creative and dynamic work environment. That seems to be a little bit more important for engineering and IT students than it is for business students. So that's the sort of zoomed in, but if we zoom out and think about what this means, it cl it's very clear that they want to lay a foundation for their future. They're thinking about their future. They want to make sure that they ensure that optimistic perspective of having a better outcome and having a better life and a better standard of living than their parents. Um, so future career, leaders who support my development, and training and development um, is, a, is a very important and very strong theme um, throughout the region. Think about, okay, well that's what they aspire to, but what are they afraid of? Um, you'll see here that their biggest fear, their number one biggest concern is that they won't realize their career goals. So in many parts of the world, when we asked young talent and millennials, you know, what is your biggest fear? Most of them said that they get stuck with no development opportunities. But in Latin America, they're thinking even more long term and that they won't realize their ultimate goals. Um, and I think this is incredibly key to know because if you are a global company headquartered in Asia or a global, headquarter, uh, global company headquartered in Western Europe, you're going to be talking to talent very different and catering to their sort of wishes and fears in a very different way than you are in Latin America. And this to me is just a very stark example of the things that keep this young talent, this young generation up at night and how that varies across the globe. The next key theme that we see is that companies tend to trump industries. And this is a really unique for Latin America. Um, in a lot of parts of the world, we find, um, and, and, and maybe even historically, we find that industries tend to matter. So um, in our research and in our survey, we ask talent, you know, what industry would you prefer to work in? We also ask them, which of these employers are your ideal employers? And when we compare those two data sets, we find that oftentimes people are picking a company regardless of its industry or despite its industry um, without regard to it. Um, and let me give you some examples of why. A lot of American students here are drawn specifically to companies, as I was saying. So if we use fast-moving consumer goods or FMCG or CPG, whatever you, um, consumo massivo, whatever you, you call it, you can see here that in the orange is the percent of talent choosing this industry as their preferred industry. Um, but then the bar on the right is the percent of students that, and the percent of talent that is choosing Coca-Cola as their ideal employer. And so just in this one company example, for every single country in Latin America, you can see how much stronger the brand of Coca-Cola is than the industry brand. Now, Coca-Cola may be a, an extreme example, especially considering it's such a strong brand in Latin America. It's been in the region for a very long time. But I, we see this across various industries um, and various markets. And what we continue to find is that companies who position themselves with a strong employer brand and strong associations 
tend to win talent um, despite the fact that their industry is maybe less attractive. Of course, there's exceptions to the rule. So if we look specifically at Chile, for example, we see that mining companies and the mining industry have similar levels of attractiveness at around 12%. Um, but you can see banks, for example, banks are a much more attractive industry than the companies that um, talent is actually selecting to work for. Um, and the inverse of that is fast mover consuming goods, fast moving consuming goods. And you see that the individual companies on the far right at 9% tend to be more attractive than, than the actual industry. So important to think about your communication and your messaging and your industry. Of course, there's implications if you work in an industry that's had some crises as of late, um, like the oil and gas industry in the United States for the past 10 years has had, come under a lot of heat. Um, banking also gets a lot of scrutiny um, and continues to in the region. You know, thinking about the implications of that for sure on your brand, but also not limiting yourself to only being a byproduct of your industry's brand and figuring out how do you make your company stand out because talent is really looking at you as an employer, not just your industry. The next trend is a, a, a one of perception. So in the perception of young talent, government is safe, but they're not quite sure if it's influential. Um, and what do I mean by that? If we look at the rankings at Brazil and then Costa Rica and Panama, these are the top employers selected in these markets. Um, by business students. You can see that all the companies in red are government affiliated or big, um, either government affiliated or government owned organizations. So we continue to see that there is an interest on a national level to work for some of these more stable institutions. Um, and that is consistent with what we've, what we've seen in terms of looking for security and stability, a large portion of the talent um, in Latin America wants those, those aspects in their job. Um, so government and state and employers, despite maybe themes of corruption, um, certain things happening, Petrobras being a great example, um, they, it remains a very attractive place to work on the, on the whole and at large. Um, and if we look at the mining sector, um, we see that state-owned enterprises play a really, really big role. Um, so this is a bit difficult to read, um, but this graph is the percentage of students preferring public sector as a postgraduate industry um, among five Latin markets. And you can see that um, they want a government job, and when they want a government job, the things that they're looking for are security and stability on the left, and they have an interest in serving the greater good. So these are key themes for them as they're looking at government um, jobs and stable jobs. And so as you're an organization, if you offer some of these attributes, serving the greater good, secure and stable work environment, um, it's really key that you're communicating these because these are, these are really attractive to people who are looking to move into that public sector. So they say they want to work at these state-owned institutions, but when we ask them, you know, who, who do you think has the strongest ability to influence um, society? Um, it's only 23% of Latin Americans feel that government has the ability to influence society. They very much have to focus on the individual and the private sector. So even though they're choosing these institutions, they very much believe in their own power to influence um, and, and make a difference and leave an impact. The next uh, theme here is that they'll pack their bags, but why? Um, and what do I mean by that? This year in our research, because we were able to do our research across eight countries, we were able to ask questions around mobility and if there's a willingness to relocate and move. You know, this region is tied together in a big way by language, um, but how fluid are those borders and what would motivate talent to move across them? Um, we asked this question, are you willing to move? We found that Peruvians and Chileans were the most willing to move to another country for work. 63% um, of Peruvians said that they would be willing to leave their home country um, absolutely for work. So 
then we said, okay, well, that's a really interesting talent pool. When we, looked, when we talked earlier about export of talent, right, this is consistent with seeing Peru as one of the big exporters of talent. Then we asked ourselves, well, why is that the case? What would actually motivate them to move? So we asked them. And students who would consider to move think oppor opportunistically about their careers. So they're looking for better professional training and development. They're looking for attractive remuneration and benefits. Um, you know, a job with a company that is exciting and a job with prestigious, successful company. So those of you on the line who are global organizations or even local organizations and looking to recruit talent from other parts within the region, these are some of the motivators and the reasons why talent wants to cross borders. You know, when I did a stint, I was living down in Argentina and running an operation for Google down there, and we needed talent from all over the region to be able to speak various accents um, of Latin American Spanish because we were operating a business for the whole region out of Argentina. And I found it was actually pretty easy to recruit Colombians and Peruvians, for example, because many of them had traveled down to Argentina for work. Um, so thinking about what brings them to the market and then what keeps them to the market is also a great way for you to learn how to expand your talent pool um, beyond what's available currently at your fingertips. The final theme here that we're just touching on is social or die, um, and it sounds a bit extreme. Uh, maybe social or bust is a better way to put this, but um, Latin Americans are on social all day and all the time. Um, and many of you know this because as you're listening to this webinar, you may be checking your Facebook page on your phone or uh, participating, switching between screens and, and seeing what's going on in the world. We're all super connected via social. But you may ask the question, what does that have to do with recruitment? What does that have to do with my employer brand? Um, and I would say it has everything to do with your employer brand because talent is there for one, and so that's where you can interact with them. But we also ask talent, where do you want to talk to employers? And they tell us where they want to talk to employers. So just to dig into the data a little bit, Latin Americans are avid consumers of social media. You can see here the average, average number of hours per day spent by social media users um, as of January 2015. And you've got Argentina, Mexico, and Brazil up there in the top um, consumers of social media. So heavy consumers. And as an employer, as you think about interacting with social media and, and why you should focus on it, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that um, we could get into here, but some of the key benefits of social media as you think about channels and interacting with talent um, is that it's highly relevant, as we've discussed. It's incredibly cost-effective, and it's measurable. So for those of you who have built strategies or are thinking about building your communication strategies in the market um, to track the talent across this region, um, it's a way to measure your investment and make sure your investment is really paying off. So it's becoming an increasingly important channel, um, and we've seen adoption rates increase 32x in terms of the number of employers that are actually building a presence on social media for their employer brand, building Facebook pages, building LinkedIn pages, building um, Instagram pages. It's skyrocketing because there's a realization that this is a very effective platform um, and a very interactive one. We ask talent where they want to learn about an employer, and when they tell us the most used channel to learn about employers in Latin America, number one is social media. So you can see in green, all of those are digital um, platforms, and digital is great, it's measurable, it's scalable, you can get really good reach, um, but if you're not on social media, they are, um, and that's a huge miss in terms of your opportunity to recruit, especially with talent in Latin America. That said, and it, what's important, and for those of you on the line who have any background in marketing, you know that a strong marketing mix is really critical to be successful. So you can't just go through one channel. Um, and Latin Americans still really want face-to-face -face interactions, and they want to hear from employers on campus. So this chart is a bit confusing to read, but you can see sort of those dark dots being Latin American countries, and it's the percentage of students who would like employers to invest more in their campus present, about between 40 and 50 percent want them to, to be more present on campus. Um, 
kind of similar percentage between 35 and 45 percent of Latin American students have learned about employers through campus presentations. So campus continues to be important and I would encourage you to continue to invest there, especially when you're looking at young talent in Latin America. Um, but it's key to know that it, it, if you don't have a balance and a solid media mix, um, as well as one consistent message across platforms, you are undergoing a really tremendous risk of losing talent to, to your competitors. So to, to briefly recap, and then I definitely want to take time for questions from you. Um, I know this was a lot of information, but hopefully you find some of it helpful. Um, you know, the seven themes um, to know about talent in Latin America today is number one, our future talent pipeline is vast, but with limits in Latin America. Um, number two, Latin America is not homogenous. It's not all the same. Three, work-life balance can get lost in translation. You've got to know what it means for you. Um, four, optimism isn't the same thing as relax when it comes to thinking about a career. Five, company tends to trump industry. Um, six, government is safe, but is it really influential and talent skepticism around that? Um, and seven, social or die. So key points maybe to take away um, if you've jotted a few things down today or maybe some things to reflect on and bring back to your next HR meeting as you're sort of talking about what do you want to do with your employer brand and where are you going to focus to win in these markets. Um, here are some key points to think about. First, there is a large diverse pool of talent in Latin America. Um, as we said, when positioning what work-life balance means at your organization, it's really important to understand how it's uniquely defined for talent in each country. Um, third is offering employees ways to be creative and entrepreneurial in the work is a key way to attract this group because creativity and entrepreneurialism is really important to them. Four, optimistic mindsets of talent put employers at an advantage. Um, however, there's a strong need to communicate how your organization will set this target group sorry, see this set this talent group up for long-term success. So you've got to capitalize on this opportunistic spirit, but also communicate how you're going to set them up for their future. Number five, in Latin America, focusing on your company's brand could be more impactful than highlighting the industry you're in and how do you build a unique voice for your company. Entities remain highly attractive due to the stability that they offer. Seven, mobility of talent is a key strategic opportunity to attract top talent. So understand the mobility, what motivates people to move, and um, why. And use these tactics to bring talent and increase your talent pool. And number eight, it is critical to engage talent across multiple channels. Social media and face-to-face -face interactions are the most impactful for your talent attraction strategies. Um, so. Uh, again, I hope that you took something away from today, um, and I really appreciate everyone signing in and joining. Now, maybe we should turn to um, questions. All right. Um, so if you have questions, you can enter them into the chat box now. Um, the first one, one we always get, is if we'll be sending out the slides or recording afterwards. And the answer is yes. We'll make sure that you get the material. Um, so if you're on the line or if you, um, for those of those of you who had to leave, um, we'll be sending this out um, shortly. So another question that came in is, um, we are a global organization and trying to understand how much to localize. Do you have any advice? Yeah, thanks, Kat. I think that's a, it's such a big question. Um, and I think every global organization faces this challenge to some extent. Um, you know, I, my, my, take on this is it's really key, two, two key pieces. One, do you know who you're trying to recruit? Um, and two, do you really understand them? Um, so every business is going to have variants around um, what markets they're going into, what their business needs are, and things like that. But if you don't understand the people you're trying to recruit and how they differ market by market, then you can't know how much you actually need to localize. Um, so localization should come after a deeper understanding of the market so that you can scale well. So earlier I referenced, you know, how Brazilian talent was more like the U.S. If you're a U.S.-based company, you may not need to localize as much or in the same ways in Brazil as you maybe need to in Mexico or Costa Rica or Argentina. So I think the key to winning and making sure you're optimizing your resources really well is to first understand the markets that you're entering into to know how much localization is actually required. But it's definitely a challenge that we, we work with many organizations on. 
All right, great. Um, another one about um, about social media. What channels do you find most effective when doing social media work with your clients? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, you guys have probably seen either you do social media strategies or you've seen other people out there doing really innovative things on Instagram or um, Pinterest. Facebook, LinkedIn, um, you know, it does depend on the market. We found that in Latin America, Facebook is actually um, the highest uh, adopted channel and the, the most heavily used. Um, it's also really common for employers to interact with talent on Facebook. So I know that in the United States, LinkedIn tends to be a preference in a lot of cases. Um, it, Facebook is um, globally, um, certainly the best channel, but it, it over indexes in Latin America. And many of the strategies we've built out We've done some Instagram and things like that, but Facebook is, is definitely a way to get the reach um, that you're looking for and the engagement that you're looking for. Okay, great. Um, where can I find this information at the country level? So we have, we just shared today some of the trends. We have obviously eight markets and a ton of data. As I mentioned, we have hundreds of thousands of data points um, to go off of. So we're happy to chat with you further. Um, if you have specific questions around um, a country that you're focused on or a country that you operate in and some of the trends for the talent there, we can definitely follow up with you with um, more detailed information. Okay. There's a couple more here. Um, did the slides have a breakdown of responses by diversity, meaning gender? And if so, how different were the responses? That's a really good question. Um, at this level, we didn't do a data cut for the whole region. Um, country by country, we do have some, some data and insights about how um, male versus female responded. And um, yeah, we definitely have that information, um, but not at the regional level today. We're happy to follow up with you on that. Great. Um, with a lot of the turnarounds in the economy and, and politics in Brazil, many of the government-related companies are losing that sense of job security. Do we expect that Brazil's talent exporter profile will rise? As in they will export more talent? That's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know, uh, to be honest, but I think it's a, it's a really... Um, interesting theme we're seeing. I mean, we definitely, I expected that trend to happen in Argentina with the economic climate in Argentina. And in fact, it wasn't one of the countries that was exporting the most talent. There's a ton of pride um, amongst Argentines to be part of their country and stay in their country. So I think there's some cultural things um, and feasibility questions we have to consider. Um, but I think it's a really interesting point. Um, on the topic of, you know, companies like um, Petrobras, you know, it's, it's super interesting. We have seen them decrease in attractiveness. Last year, they were ranked number one. This year, came in at number five, uh, which doesn't seem like much of a change given all the things that they've gone through. Um, but we actually did a deeper dive to look at some of the associations that talent has with them as an employer. So um, they're, they're much less uh, associated with, for example, uh, being a trustworthy organization and having integrity um, and a lot of the attributes associated with them have decreased over time and so what we expect will happen is that will deteriorate um, their overall rankings um, yeah eventually over time and I think the implications are much bigger than than what we see on the surface but um, yeah really great question thank you for that great um, here's another question on um, looks like more professional talent so do we have similar information on more senior talent in LADAM um, rather than the recent grad information that we showed. Yeah, we do have um, graduate level data. Um, it's a it's a different you know focus for us, but we definitely have some trends that we've seen. We do a lot of custom work as well with clients on um, specific segments that they're focused on. So um, graduate, postgraduate, even sort of at the senior management level. Um, but the bulk of the foundation of our research is um, at the student level. We surveyed over 1.2 million students globally this year. So that's where sort of the bulk of this data uh, comes from. Um, and do we break it down by whether they speak English or not? Um, language, language proficiency is part of our survey, but we find that asking someone if they speak English isn't always the same as whether or not they speak English. Um, and we don't obviously test their language proficiency. So that's not a huge focus for us, but Certainly, when there's organizations that have a requirement of language, we um, we can do you know deeper dives into the the data and the research to understand um, preferences among bilingual talent, for example. Great. 
Um, all right, if there are any other questions, you can submit them now, but it looks like we are pretty much through them. Um, that said, you know, if there are specific questions like these about, you know, particular breakdowns of the data or anything that you're interested in, we would be happy to follow up with you um, after the call. You know, Carly's information is on the slide and um, we'll be in touch, like I said, with the slides and the recording. So we would be happy to continue this conversation. Yeah, and um, I love talking about this stuff. I can geek out all day long, um, just talking about the trends and some of the things that we've seen um, and would love to share with you, you know, ways in which we're, we're understanding the implications for organizations with this and, and what tactics and strategies are working for companies so that we can help you uh, build a brand that's gonna bring in the right people for the future uh, of your organization. So happy to chat. Please feel free to drop me a line or give me a call. Um, I travel to, the, I'm in New York, based in New York, but I travel down to the market quite frequently. So I um, would love to, whether you're stateside or um, south of the border, would love to have a chance to grab a coffee and, and chat more. Great. Um, all right. Thanks and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.